Hi, this is Rich Baker with the Bluegrass Ramble, and we're speaking with Ricky Skaggs. And Ricky will be in Columbus on May the 10th, on Friday, performing with Kentucky Thunder at the Pro Musica Chamber Orchestra event at the Southern Theater at 8 o'clock. Ricky Skaggs, welcome to the Bluegrass Ramble. Well, great to be with you, Rich. Thanks for having me on. It's our pleasure. Uh, You've won 14 Grammys, and you've played with bands like Ralph Stanley, The Country Gentleman, The New South, Emmylou Harris, of course, your band now, Kentucky Thunder. But I'm wondering, what's it like to play with a chamber orchestra? Well, it's always a challenge, um, but it's it's a lot of fun. We really enjoy playing with with orchestras, and uh, we got some beautiful charts that we've had written for us. Uh, some instrumental things, uh, you know, just some backing tracks, and then just some vocal things that we, that we do as well. And uh, but it's a it's a it's a real it, it's a real treat for us because it it's, it makes it you know it's not so much the same thing every night you know when we go out and just blast through you know blazing bluegrass things you know we have to kind of slow things down a little bit and uh, uh but it's it's just a great uh a great event we always love love playing it and this will be i think our first time to play with the uh with the columbus chamber orchestra well we're really looking forward to it and i know uh, i know you are as well and when you think back over your your long career in music both uh, bluegrass and and country is is there any career highlight that kind of rises to the top for you well there've been a, excuse me there've been a lot of things that's been great you know first number one record and crying my heart out over you which was a <clears throat> bluegrass song for me you know a lot of people didn't know it yet but uh it was a a flat and scrubs bluegrass thing and um uh, but you know, I probably, you know, in 1985, uh, CMA Entertainer of the Year was a was a pretty big deal. I mean, that's really the that's the biggest, you know, award you can win in country music. You know, and um, it was a it was just a major major league thing for me. Uh, the next year, Sharon and I, my wife, uh, we won Duet of the Year, uh, Duo, I guess they call it Duo of the Year, and uh, for Love Can't Ever Get Better Than This. And uh, it's funny that we're talking about that because uh, we are currently in the studio right now working on our first duet CD, Um, that CD, or the the, the single that came out, you know, in 86 was uh, from one of my albums, one of my CDs. And uh, so uh, this is our first time to actually do a Ricky and Sharon, you know, CD, so we are so excited about it. It sounds so great. And she is just singing just great. And, and, uh, the music is, uh, music is very, very sweet. And, uh, kind of Don Williams meets, uh, um, uh, I don't know, Ricky Scott <laughs> somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in there. It's just, it, it's, uh, it's just a beautiful, uh, bunch of music. And I, I can't wait to, for you guys to hear it. So it, uh, don't have a scheduled date for for the whole thing to come out. We're just cutting an EP right now of about five songs, but we're going to finish them up uh, sometime this year, and and uh, it, I'm sure it'll be out next year sometime. We'll certainly look forward to that. Uh, uh, this is the Bluegrass Ramble. We're speaking with Ricky Skaggs of Ricky Skaggs and Kentucky Thunder, who will be performing with the Pro Musica Chamber Orchestra right here in Columbus at the Southern Theater on May the 10th at 8 o'clock. And, Ricky, you just touched on something I wanted to ask you about anyway, and that is uh, you you have been credited with actually uh, saving country music, and I think the the spirit of that comment meant that you, uh, in your career, uh, had had drawn on an element of country music that was uh, really very firmly rooted in, uh, in in the traditional sound of country music. And to that end, you've you have pulled uh, songs from the bluegrass repertoire as part of your country music shows, such as uh, cheat, uh, "Don't Cheat in Our Hometown," for example, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, just just talk a little bit about um, about why you you uh, pulled some of those types of songs for your your brand of country music. Well, my whole uh, I guess wasn't really a plan. I don't think I had a plan necessarily when I came to Nashville in 1980 to, you know, try to get a, a record deal. I just finished working with Amy Lou Harris for two and a half years. And, um, 
so she was going to take a year off. I had bills to pay, so I, I needed to, to get going and do something, and I thought that now was the best time to, to do that, you know. And uh, But I um, I always had a love for, you know, for traditional country music. I always loved George Jones. He was my favorite, and I loved, you know, Haggard and, and uh, you know, of course, the old older guys, Webb Pierce and Ray Price and those guys, uh, Buck Owens. I always loved that, and my mother loved that kind of music. My dad was more into, you know, the Delmore Brothers and the Blue Sky Boys and the Monroe Brothers and the old, you know, Jimmy Rogers and that kind of thing. It was more into old-time traditional music, uh, mountain music, uh, and Mom was into a little bit more, you know, country and bluegrass. Of course, she loved Bill Monroe, Flat Scrubs, and people like that, but she loved listening to the radio and loved to hear, you know, Patsy Cline and Lori Lynn. Uh, so when I came to, to Nashville, I really felt that like there was such a void um, of tradition in country music. I mean, uh, it had really gone urban. It had gone, you know, uh, uptown, so to speak. It had really, um, the, the whole urban cowboy, um, you know, that movie was out, and it was, everything was going urban cowboy, you know. So anyway, I just, uh, and, and that plus uh, hearing, Every commercial, not every commercial, but lots of big commercials on television, Toyota, you know, American Express, uh, a lot of the major, um, you know, products were using uh, bluegrass instrumentation in their ads. You know, you'd hear a banjo, you'd hear a fiddle, a mandolin, and it's all to draw attention. You know, that music draws your ear to it. You know, bluegrass music does. Um, so I just felt like that if, if there would be some way that I could mix my bluegrass roots, my bluegrass elements in with traditional sounding country music, uh, and mix the mandolin, the banjo and the fiddle as loud as the electric guitar, the piano and the steel guitar, um, and have, you know, have a nice strong rhythm with, with drums and piano, whatever, and, uh, and bass that, uh. I might have an opportunity to have to have a you know a, a sound that uh, that would really work at radio and that people would would listen to and and, and would sell records and uh, so that happened uh, you know the first thing we did was uh, first single was uh, don't get above your raisin Flight Scruggs tune that uh, that I, I took and rearranged and but it's still very acoustic but it still had a very heavy you know back beat to it as well and. Uh, and then the third single was uh, "Crying My Heart Out Over You," which was a, uh, a Flat and Scruggs tune that, uh, that uh, I made a very country version out of, but with the bluegrass style harmonies and the and the three, you know, the triple fiddles of Bobby Hicks and all that. It just it it worked. And then uh, when we came out with "Highways and Heartaches," which you know, had a heartbreak and Highway 40 Blues and "Wouldn't Change You If I Could," those those kind of songs, that just kind of catapulted me into uh, you know into you know, new artist status that 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 was having you know having success and 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 the the best part about it you know the, for me the payoff really was to see people like Ralph and Bill Monroe and Jimmy Martin and 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 people from the bluegrass field that I had grown up around that was embracing what I was doing and seeing the fact that I was I, I hadn't turned my back on bluegrass that I was actually bringing the sounds of bluegrass into what I was doing with country and turning turning country music fans onto bluegrass. That was my, you know, that was the payoff for me was to see young kids come up and want to know about Bill Monroe or want to know about Flat and Scruggs and Stanley's and, and uh, you know, calling what I was doing bluegrass, which I knew it wasn't bluegrass because, you know, I, I knew what bluegrass was. But but uh, anyway, it was just a, it was just a great, uh, a great payoff for me and, and, uh, um, and, you know, of course, as anything, you know, after eight or ten years, things are going to start changing again. So I think the tastes in country music uh, started, you know, really really changing a lot in the early 90s. Uh, you know, it was the big uh, the big tours, the 14 bus tours and, and uh, that kind of thing. And, and uh, country was getting very pop sounding again. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just, uh, that was really the reason for me wanting to go back you know of course after Mr. Monroe passed away in 96 
that was uh, he and my dad both passed away that same year, and uh, so I felt like you know what I needed to do was to go take my place around the table of bluegrass, and you know not to ever take Mr. Monroe's place because there's nobody that that could sit there at the head of the table, you know, but him. And uh, but I felt like I had a place in bluegrass, and I wanted to I wanted to go take that place and uh, you know ha- start a record label Skaggs family and and uh, which was has been great for me and it's it's given new artists uh, you know Blue Highway and uh, Cadillac Sky Mountain Heart uh, groups like that you know even gave Phil McCurry a place that he, he did three records for you know for a while before he uh, left and started his own label which which was great for him so it was just a it was a real real good thing and a good move for me mm-hmm. but uh, those early days were were very special and uh and they helped to create a uh you know a name and notoriety for me where it afforded me the the, the abilities to do what I'm doing now Rick we're speaking with Ricky Skaggs right now Ricky Skaggs and Kentucky Thunder speaking of the early days Ricky uh you touched on something uh the back in uh, in the '60s and '70s the South End of Columbus was a uh, hotbed for bluegrass music the Astro Inn uh, the Bluegrass Palace, and so forth. Now, you played there uh, uh, in uh, in the earlier part of your career, I think, along with uh, Keith Whitley as part of uh, Ralph Stanley's band. And you relate a story uh, to me I'd like for you to share with our, our listeners of uh, down at the Country Palace. Well, it was, uh, I think it was New Year's of 1970. It was going into 1971. And uh, we had met Ralph. We had actually played... Uh, we played Frontier Ranch with Ralph uh, probably in June or July that year. Uh, we'd met Ralph earlier in 1970 when he, you know, his his bus had a flat tire, and me and Keith and my dad and, and Keith's brother Dwight had gone to Fort Gay, West Virginia, to see this new lead singer with Ralph named Roy Lee Centers. And uh, so we uh, we went there to see him, and Ralph called the, the little – beer joint with that we'd gone to and he called the owner and said hey i've had a flat tire on the bus and i'm going to be 30 or 45 minutes late just wanted to let you know you know and so the the house was packed and uh so uh the club owner had heard you know me and keith sing a little bit around town and asked if you know if we'd get up and sing a few songs and of course the only songs we knew were stanley brothers songs and and uh so 30 minutes later when ralph walks in here here we are you know, two young kids with, you know, with my dad and, and uh, Keith's brother, Dwight, playing banjo. Here we're singing, you know, Don't Cheat in Our Hometown. We're singing, uh, you know, uh, all the old Columbia and Richard Tone label records that Ralph probably hadn't sung in 25 or 30 years, you know. And uh, and so that's how we met Ralph uh, and got to know him. Well, we... Uh, we went to Columbus for this uh, for this New Year's thing, and uh, we were going to be be playing. Jimmy Martin kind of was head headlining the show, and uh, so uh, he came up to Ralph and asked Ralph, if, you know, if he could borrow me as a as a tenor singer because his tenor singer didn't show up or he was sick or something like that. And and uh, I was kind of in a way kind of hoping Ralph would say, well, no, I've got Rick here for me, and you know he's he's going to be working so. But he did, and he said, "Well, sure." Said, "Ask you know, ask Rick if he wants to do it, you know." And I and I said, "Well, I can, I guess, but I, I'm not sure. I know, you know, that many of your songs, you know. I'm sorry, but anyway, it worked out, and we had a quick rehearsal and jumped right on stage. And uh, so I would just kind of, I, I just kind of watched, you know, watched every mouth movement that jimmy did that night which he was always hard to watch on stage because he jumped around like a, a, a crazy man <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> and uh but uh that it was a fun thing and it, and it started a relationship with me and him that that was good you know and uh and i i always loved playing the columbus area because there are so many bluegrass fans there and you know got a i got a very special connection with columbus i'm of course i lived in west jefferson for Two or three years, my my grand grandfather and grandmother, uh, my my granddad worked on the Darby Dan farm out on uh, right off forty, mm-hmm. out Fort uh, um, uh, Old West Jeff. Yeah, and uh, mm-hmm. so anyway, uh, but uh, Hazel Lambert, uh, Pee Wee Lambert's widow, uh, lives there, and and uh, of course Pee Wee 
was one of my heroes from the Ralph from the Ralph and Carter Stanley days. Uh, Pee Wee joined the band in nineteen, uh, I guess forty five, and uh, and was with the band till fifty one, and uh, made all these classic recordings. You know, uh, White Dove, Angels Are Singing in Heaven Tonight, Fields Are Turned Brown. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, all those great great songs, Lonesome River, that that just you know really touched my heart as a kid. And uh, anyway, uh, I ended up 40 years later after meeting, you know, Hazel in 1971 or 1970, actually, at Frontier Ranch. I ended up with Pee Wee's mandolin. You know, I've got his old F5 mandolin that he, he recorded all those songs with. And so wow. um, I know he was playing at Hillbilly Heaven, Heaven or Haven, whatever they used to call it. Some uh-huh. call it Haven, some call it Heaven, some call it Hell. <laughs> you know, but... Uh, Anyway, he uh, he had an accident with his mandolin and dropped it and broke the headstock out of it and was so distraught and so tore up over it. It was his prized mandolin, you know, and he looked at it and just didn't think it could ever be fixed again, you know, and threw it in a trash can outside the <clears throat> outside the, 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 the club there. And uh, uh, Frank Wakefield and Dorsey Harvey uh, had come over, I guess, from, from Dayton uh, with Red Allen to see... Uh, to see the Stanley's play or see Pee Wee play. And uh, that was 1961. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, anyway, uh, they took it out of the trash can and I guess fighters, keepers, losers, weepers. And uh, <laughs> Frank tried to fix it up and all of that. But uh, anyway, it, it ended up in my hands. And, uh, you know, my mother prayed earnestly for that mandolin, hoping I would have it someday. And uh, she went home to be with the Lord in 2000. You know, and uh, um, I got the mandolin, you know, in 2010. So uh, it's an amazing story. It's all in my book that's coming out in August. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, But it's it's an amazing story and kind of kind of makes Columbus seem a little uh, a little nearer and dearer to my heart. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. That's amazing. Just have one more uh, question for you, Ricky. We're speaking with Ricky Skaggs, by the way. Ricky Skaggs and Kentucky Thunder, who will be performing with Pro Music, a chamber orchestra at the Southern Theater. Um, I recall the International Bluegrass Music Association annual meeting one year you were hosting. You were at the podium, big audience filled with uh, people, and um, Bill Monroe was in the audience. Uh, it might have been, might have been the first, might have been the first year he was there. I, I can't recall that, but I do recall him sitting there with that big white hat and his white suit on. Mm-hmm. And uh, you were uh, emceeing, and um, all of a sudden he he jumps up out of the audience and with his cane, walks all the way down the aisle of the theater, up the stairs. Everybody was praying he wouldn't fall. He was, but he was a big, strong guy. Even even then, came up to the podium, and there you were. And I remember um, he said something like, um, "Is it okay if I come up here?" <laughs> and you uh, you had, had turned the, the uh, podium over to him. Of course, he gave a, a great uh, a series of comments and everything, and it just brought the house down. It really just leads up to, I know you've had, you had a long-standing uh, friendship with Bill Monroe. Uh, just talk a little bit about what Bill Monroe means to you. Well, he was, uh, he was always bigger than life, and he was always, you know, a huge star in my eyes and a, and a mentor. Uh, not a lot of, not a lot of people can say, you know, there's been a lot of great musicians in the world, but you know, there's, there's very few that history can, can cite to a man that, that started a, you know, a whole, you know, genre of music. And, uh, and you know, and and uh, I certainly realized, and, and he certainly realized that he didn't start it by himself. You know, I mean, he mm-hmm. uh, it was his band, his name, his notoriety, and, and and him being a star, a member of the Grand Ole Opry, that really, really helped catapult everything. But but um, you know, he was uh, he was an amazing person. You know, I got to meet him when I was six years old. I went to see him in Martha, Kentucky. Uh, this is also in the book, a great story, but uh, my dad bought me a mandolin when I was five, and uh, so I'd been playing almost a year, and uh, Bill was was coming to Martha, Kentucky, to the high school, so we got up there, uh, you know, to see him, and we got there a little bit early, and 
because we wanted to see him drive in, you know, and, and uh, we just thought that would be so cool to see him pull in, you know, and unload the whatever vehicle they had. And, and I've never really seen a picture of Bill Monroe, so I didn't know what he looked like. I'd only heard him on the Grand Ole Opry and heard Mom and Dad talk about him, and so they made him, you know, big as Godzilla to me, you know, a little six-year-old towhead. And uh, so he... Uh, he finally pulls in, you know, they got this old black limousine and everything and they, they, they pull in and everybody kind of just rushes, you know, around the car and, and everybody's trying to get out, you know, and so anyway, they, they finally get in, get set up and everything. And, uh, after about 30 minutes of the show, some of the neighbors in the hood there started, you know, requesting, Hey, let little Ricky Skaggs get up and sing a song, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, so after, after two or three times of that, I think he was ready to get it over with, you know. So he he finally calls me up on stage, and, and I don't think he really knew how little I was, you know. But uh, anyway, he he just kind of bends over the stage and grabs me grabs me by the arm and just pulls me up on the stage, you know, and uh, asks me what I played, and I told him I played the mandolin, and so he just kind of laughed, you know, and and uh, took his mandolin off and put it on me. And well, that size mandolin is an F5, and for a little six-year-old, it's it's like a guitar nearly that that big. You know, the little mandolin I had was like a half pint size, and so uh, anyway, I I did Ruby, the, the Osborne Brothers song, Ruby, Are You Mad at Your Man? Mm-hmm. You know, a great song for a six-year-old to be singing, but. Uh, it was either that or the pinball machine, and Mother had already told me not to sing that pinball song yeah. <laughs> when I got, I got up there. So anyway, I did that song, and and uh, you know, of course, the crowd on my on my side. I'm their, you know, I'm a little hometown kid, and but you know, I fell in love with Bill Monroe that night because he was kind to me. He was gentle with me. Um, he he was the kind of star that was not uh, so engulfed in himself that he couldn't, you know, back up and let, you know, a little kid, you know, have share the stage for a minute, you know, and, and I just, uh, I don't know. I don't know what he saw in me, but I certainly know what I saw in him mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and it, it created a relationship. I didn't see him again for, for nearly 10 years, um, at Frontier Ranch that, that I mentioned there in Columbus. That was the next time I saw him, I was working with Ralph and, mm-hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, we had a great relationship, and especially the last 10 years of his life here in Nashville. Uh, you know, we I'd go over nearly, you know, nearly every week. If I, if I had a day off, you know, uh, from my tour schedule, I'd always call him up and say, are you hungry? Uh, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. I said, well, let's go, let's go get something to eat. And he said, well, I'll meet you down at the gate, you know. And uh, so he'd walk down from his house to this little, this little cattle gate that he had down there, keep his horses and cows in, and... We'd get in the car and we'd go eat and we'd, you know, spend an hour or two together. Or I'd go over to his house and take my mandolin. We'd sit around picking and, and uh, not saying any, but we'd just sit and play instrumentals and wouldn't say ten words in three hours, you know. Mm-hmm. But that was his way of talking. Yep. And uh, so I, I've got great memories and I've got, uh, I had a great relationship and a real friendship there with him uh, that uh, that I'll I'll cherish all my life. Well, Ricky, it's been uh, truly an honor uh, to uh, for you to uh, to join us here at uh, honor for us certainly for you to join us here on this interview today and uh, to spend so much time sharing some great stories with us uh, for our listeners of the Bluegrass Ramble here at WOSU. So, thank you so much for your time today. Good luck with the uh, Pro Music Chamber Orchestra, and we hope to see you again real soon. Well, looking forward to coming seeing you guys. Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks, Ricky. We appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.